Uh, hello, uh, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, now, uh, I will be sharing with you uh, some tales from my pitiful existence momentarily. But before we properly crack on, I just want to establish a moral level for the room. I've got some fairly disgusting tales, but I want to give you the moral power. I don't want to offend any of you. Uh, so what I'd like you, to, like you to do on the count of three, uh, so we can properly gauge your moral level, is I would like you all to shout out your favourite swear word for me. <laughs> yeah, you see, that's, there's a certain level of self-consciousness that settles on people when I ask them. You can genuinely say whatever swear would you fancy. Like, there's some intellectual discussion. Are we going to say that word? Oh, no, that's a bloke going, oh, fuck, I'm with my mum. Uh, <laughs> that's excellent. I want to know your genuinely favourite swear word. Really shake off the shackles of self-consciousness with this. Uh, your favourite swear word for the sake of the English language. Really fucking bellow this now. <laughs> on the count of three. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was genuinely beautiful. <laughs> That's excellent. It's nice, though, people's attitudes towards swearing are slowly changing. Uh, I think people are realising there is nothing innately offensive about language. It's the sentiment behind language that causes offence. Uh, the older my dad gets, the angrier he gets. Consequently, he, he is just magnificent at swearing. He's 62 years old now. He's the angriest human being I've ever met. Uh, a couple of months ago, we were in a shopping centre. We were on an escalator within that shopping centre, uh, and there were two slightly plump middle-aged ladies blocking our way on the escalator. You know, normally in that situation, the traditional, proper, decent, great British thing to do is to maybe tut at the most extreme, but generally you just wait till you get to the top or bottom of the escalator. Uh, not my dad. My dad simply shouted, Oh, get out of my way, you dawdling whores! <laughs> Turns out that is 100% effective. Those dawdling whores dawdled no longer. <laughs> uh, he's like my absolute hero in life, my dad, because the two things he, he will not tolerate are anything he perceives to be soft uh, and anything he perceives to be politically correct. Uh, and when those two things collide, it, it's just spectacular. Um, my granddad died about a year ago. I was properly devastated when he passed away. And at his funeral, I was just in floods and buckets of tears. Uh, and my dad took me to one side at the cemetery at his own father's funeral and said to me, I don't know why you're so upset, son. He always thought you were a prick. <laughs> Because I'm fascinated by the way we all attempt to live nice or nasty lives these days. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by guilt and regret. I, I'm this weird mix, you see. I'm, I'm uh, racially Jewish, as you can probably tell, but I was also raised Catholic. Uh, so I am a Catholic in a Jew's body, uh, <laughs> which is basically guilt squared. Uh, and so I'm kind of fascinated by things. I, I wrote a, a My Name Is Earl style list of karma, a list of all the, the bad things I've done in my life, things that my conscience troubles me about, misdeeds that I feel particularly bad about. Uh, but because I'm so hide-bound by guilt and regret, my list is just a bit stupid. Uh, one of the first things I wrote on my list of karma uh, that I feel bad about is the fact that I killed a pigeon. I feel stupidly bad about that. Who here hates pigeons? Yeah. Uh, quite a few. Shout out reasons you hate pigeons. Uh, they're all very good reasons. They poo everywhere. Uh, they're, uh, they're rats with wings. Someone said dickheads. I think that's a very <laughs> extremely good reason. They're, they're all very good reasons. You get some wonderfully odd reasons given for people hating pigeons. A gig in Liverpool quite recently, uh, a bloke said that his number one reason for hating pigeons is that they don't have arms. <laughs> fairly spectacular. By that logic, that bloke should also hate the Venus de Milo, all other birds, and thieves in Saudi Arabia. It made very little <laughs> sense at all. Uh, more recently than that, a bloke in Luton said that his number one reason for hating pigeons is, and I quote, they're just piss takers. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite piece of mental illness in ages. Um, but they're, they're good reasons to hate pigeons that you've given there. They are disgusting creatures, pigeons. They fly in your face, they shit everywhere, they spread disease, their feet are fucked up. <laughs> They are disease-carrying vermin. Pigeons are rats with wings in the same way that babies are rats with rights. <laughs> <laughs> seeing, seeing how far we can push the BBC Three envelope there. Uh, I particularly hate pigeons at the moment. These two pigeons have been having sex outside my bedroom window. Very noisy. Have you ever seen pigeons really go at it? It's this horrible sort of flurry of feathers and biology. Very noisy, very aggressive. Oddly hypnotic if you're watching it for four or five hours. <laughs> But uh, I was really at the end of my tether with it. Uh, so, and they were really wailing away on each other. So I uh, threw a flower pot at them uh, to attempt to make them fly away. But unfortunately, you can probably tell from looking at me, I'm not very good at throwing things. I accidentally hit one of the pigeons on the head <laughs> with the flower pot. Its head exploded. <laughs> Mid shag, a damn good way to go. <laughs> the other one thought it was pretty good. Uh, 
But initially, well, I thought, well, hooray for me. I've, I've killed a pigeon, but I've solved my problem. They won't roost outside my bedroom window anymore. Turns out uh, that is completely wrong. Apparently, pigeons are so disgusting and so unhygienic uh, that they will often build their nests on or out of the dead bodies of other pigeons. It's horrible, isn't it? Yeah. So there was, I think, and I'd solved my pigeon problem. All I'd actually done was built them an extension. <laughs> That's far from ideal. But here is where karma came to bite me on the arse. Because two days after I killed a pigeon because it was having sex too noisily, uh, my flatmate brought his new girlfriend home for the first time. Uh, and the sound of their lovemaking is like the sound of a million pigeons having the biggest pigeon gangbang of all time, <laughs> followed by the world exploding. Uh, I will now attempt to replicate for your delectation, <laughs> brothers and sisters of BBC Three, the noise my flatmate's girlfriend makes as she approaches climax. This, regrettably, is not an exaggeration. This is what that rancid hag <laughs> bellows through my paper thin ex council flat walls as she reaches her irrelevant epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> she honestly sounds like a clown nearly falling off a cliff. <laughs> it's, it's just the most disgraceful noise I have ever heard in my entire life. I felt guilty even trying to masturbate to it. <laughs> I'm a simple man of simple pleasures. Uh, pretty much my only real aim in life is to own my own pub and to call that pub the Go Go Gadget Arms. <laughs> My girlfriend has recently forced me to invest in some posher pairs of boxer shorts. I now own some designer boxer shorts. My girlfriend told me that seeing the word next emblazoned above my genitals was like observing the most optimistic piece of self-delusion <laughs> in the history of mankind. <laughs> and all through my life, I've just been king of the losers. But it's weird when you go through like your old stuff. It's amazing the things you forget. I found my old GCSE copy of a fellow. I'd completely forgotten how, when I was 15 years old, I'd really cleverly crossed out the T on the front cover so that it totally changes the name of the play to, Oh, hello. <laughs> That's a belter of a gag for a 15-year-old. But uh, my teenage diary also records that I fell for the following prank. Tell me if any of you ever had this tried on you. One of your mates would come up to you and go, uh, Sorry, mate, um, you've got a load of updoc in your hair. Now, it sounds more complicated than it is. All you're meant to say in that scenario is, What's up, doc? <laughs> they then say, I didn't know you were Bugs Bunny, and everyone laughs for five minutes at the infinite possibilities of language. Uh, that is what's meant to happen. I, on the other hand, started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Under the genuine belief that updock was some kind of euphemism for spunk that I was as yet unfamiliar with, weeping <laughs> and combing my hair out for 15 minutes while my friends looked on confused. <laughs> But we fast forward uh, to last year, and the two most humiliating things in my life both happened last year. I remain king of the wallies. Uh, 2008, uh, an embarrassing year. One of the first things that happened, I had to go for an STD check. I don't know if any blokes here have ever had to go for one. I had to go for the full one, which consists of the stick down your old chap. It's not very nice at all. The single most painful experience of my entire life, made somehow worse by the doctor singing Chim Chimney. <laughs> Chim Chim Cheru while he did it. Oh, Dr. Van Dyke, how cold your hands are. <laughs> but something even more humiliating than that, I passed out when I had that, but yet something even worse than that happened. May the 20th last year, I flew out to visit my girlfriend who is Australian. She lives in Melbourne. I hadn't seen her for three months. I was hugely, hugely excited to see her. So in my idiot loser way, I decided that what I was going to do for the full week and a half before I boarded my flight to Melbourne, I was going to refrain from getting at myself. I was going to leave uh, myself unrubbed and unevacuated for a full ten days, just so that I could really stock up. I could really give her both barrels when I finally saw her. I could really drown that bitch in how much I'd missed her. <laughs> it's obviously stupid. There she is in Melbourne planning nice meals we can have, nice days out. There is me thinking, oh my God, there is going to be up dock everywhere. <laughs> But, as we've established in our brief time together, life often does not work in my favour, and it very much did not work in my favour on this particular occasion, because unbelievably, at the age of 32 years old, on the Singapore to Melbourne leg of my economy flight, and I rather fear some of you may have guessed where this is going, yes, I actually had a wet dream. It was 
unbelievable. Because you wake up staring at yourself just going, oh my God, this is actually happening. This is actually happening for the first time in 14 years. I feel strangely nostalgic. But also know there is nothing you can do about that. You have to sit in your own misery for the next four and a half thousand miles. And all you've done is create a very lonely version of the Mile High Club. <laughs> That's literally all you've achieved. But the nadir of my existence was the four long, lonely years I spent working in a banking call centre. I'm not allowed to identify the name of the bank uh, on television, but it rhymes with twat vest. Uh, <laughs> the most soulless uh, four years of my life. One of my responsibilities uh, working for Twat Vest Bank uh, was I, every year I had to help organise Jeans for Jeans Day. Are you familiar with Jeans for Jeans Day? It's my favourite charity in the UK. Jeans with a J for Jeans with a G. You pay £2, you're allowed to wear jeans to work for a bit of a change, uh, and it goes to help people who have genetic disorders. Uh, staff there got a bit confused. They generally pay £2, turned up to work sporting some kind of genetic deficiency <laughs> to raise money for people who couldn't afford trousers. Uh, they tended to do that every single day of their lives as well. Uh, what I love about Jeans for Jeans Day is that that's a charity entirely based on a really bad pun. Uh, that, that's all that charity is. It's like the sort of thing you'd get in a bad 1980s sitcom. Hey darling, it's in my jeans. Yeah, and that's where it's staying. It's, I think we should have more charities also based on equally bad bits of wordplay. Jeans for Jeans could just be the jumping off point. You could have Bear for Bears. Uh, you pay two pounds, you turn up to work naked, and you're helping free grizzlies in Russia. Uh, you could have Clogs for Clogs. Uh, you wear Dutch shoes to help fat men lower their cholesterol. Uh, you could go slightly offensive with it as well. Jumpers for Jumpers. Sorry for your loss, this is cashmere. <laughs> you could have loads of fun with it. I'm going to have to leave you, you've been loads of fun. Uh, I've, I've always been trying to work out uh, uh, how sort of to be a good person. I've been asking audiences quite a lot for their philosophies on life, their maxims on life. The responses you get are really interesting. You get some weird ones though as well. A woman at a gig recently said that her philosophy on existence is everything to excess. Um, unfortunately for her, she was a big, fat, drunk slag. Uh, <laughs> slightly displaying the flaw in her own thinking. Uh, uh, but this bloke quite recently, he said he believes there's nothing you can actively do to be a good person. So the best way to live your life is wherever possible to avoid causing harm or doing wrong to any other human being. And I really like that, and that tied in with the list of karma that I mentioned before. Uh, but as I finish writing my list, I'm just so guilty about everything that it becomes a bit daft. One of the last things I wrote on my list of shame that I still feel bad about came from my time at university. My girlfriend, when I was at uni, Jodie was her name. Uh, and Jodie used to be afraid of being afraid. It's an unusually common phobia. So what I had to do each night was I had to ever so gently talk her to sleep. I would whisper sweet nothings into her ear till she'd just gradually nod off. Uh, there was one particular night we'd been doing this, and so she was all calmed down, very pleasantly blissed out. And so she rolled over, turned the lamp off, and in the darkness said, oh, I'm so glad you're here, Steve. At which point I just felt compelled to say, It's not Steve! <laughs> a horrible little bell end, I truly, truly am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you've been an absolute delight. God bless you all. I've been Stephen Hall. Cheers.